Good morning, First Church. It is wonderful to see you today. My name is Pastor Anthony. I'm the Senior Associate Minister of Mission and Vision. I am so thankful to be with you. And so we do want to extend that welcome, not only to everyone who is here in our beautiful sanctuary, but to the, the hundreds of you who are at home watching us online. And we are so grateful that you are here. If you are with us online for the first time, we want you to know that the words to our service will be printed on the bottom of your screen so that you can participate. And for all of us here, hopefully you've received a bulletin so that you can follow along. We invite you to uh, stand, or to rise in body or in spirit. We're going to be turning in a few moments to our opening hymn, which is number 381, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4, but before we get there, I invite you to turn in your bulletins as we join together in our call to worship. Though the way seems long and the road rough, we will trust the one who leads us. Though the direction is unknown and we don't know the outcome, we will place our lives in Christ's loving care. It is Christ who brings us out to green pastures and restores our souls. It is Christ who gives us hope and peace. All praise and glory to Christ our Lord. Good morning. Please join me in the reading of the Affirmation of Faith, which is printed in your bulletin, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, was buckled under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence it shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. I would like to invite all the children to come forward at this time. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to see you all today. Guess what? This week, the youth went to go see the movie Inside Out 2. And you know what? They invited me to go with them. And it was such a great movie. And I was so honored to go with them. It was really great. Um, but it made me start to think about feelings because you know that whole movie is about the young girl Riley who goes through life and has so many feelings and she's trying to figure it all out and I was like me too like all these emotions I'm trying to figure them out too so I sat down and I took a little look at it okay um let's see Yellow, yellow is joy, right? Joy represents all the happiness and all the really great things in Riley's life, right? Joy. Okay, next comes sadness. Anybody ever have some sadness? Yeah. You know the sadness, though? It's really important for us because it is... It helps us get through rough times, right? We can say we're sad and it will um, trigger those around us to know that we may need some extra care, right? Okay. Oh, then Riley has a little fella and he's anger. You know, the guy who has the fire on top of his head and sometimes he just blows up, right? You love him. <laughs> He's pretty crazy, I know. He's so funny. He is so funny. Do you know what, though? He plays a really important part of Riley's life, too, right? He helps us know when things are unfair, and it triggers us to do something about it, right? Right, we've got to have that, even though it's uncomfortable. Um, Riley also has fear, Anybody else have fear? Yep, Riley has some fear. And do you know what? Fear helps her know when her life is going to be in danger. Maybe her um, physical life or other parts um, of her feelings, right? Well, then comes disgust. Okay, yeah, disgust. Disgust, of course, has to be green, right? Green. That green is going to help her avoid choices 
that are not gonna be good for her, okay? So let's color in some green for disgust. She's gonna make wise choices because she has that feeling disgust and it's gonna trigger her to maybe choose something different. Okay, then we have um, a new one. Anxiety, anxiety. Okay, so um, anxiety helps Riley plan for the future, right? But in this movie, she lets the anxiety get a little bit out of control, right? It starts to take over and it pushes all the other feelings to the side. And that's when um, she started to have the breathing issues and she started to not be able to think clearly and her heart was racing, right? Very uncomfortable feeling. Okay, embarrassment, right? Embarrassment is pink and he doesn't want to talk to anybody or look at anybody. And the whole point of him is so that Riley doesn't make any mistakes in her social settings that might put her on the outside of all her social friends and all the things that are going on with her team, right? There were two other emotions. Do you remember what they were? On, yes, envy and Henri, that's right. There were two other ones. And those two we need to talk about more together, right? Because those are also some pretty intense emotions. Do you know what? God gave us all of these emotions that when we use them wisely and when we think about life um, and how we're going to move through and treat people and treat ourselves... All of our emotions serve a very important purpose. And that is, as a reminder, that we are greatly loved whenever we use all of our emotions wisely. If we were to let orange take over, it wouldn't be a beautiful life, right? If we were to let sadness take over, Oh, we would be all sad all the time, right? And that's not what God wants for us. God has given us a range of emotions so that we can feel everything to have a full life. Pretty cool, right? Okay. So, do you know what, Eve? You did a mighty fine job holding this box for me. You may sit for the prayer if you'd like. Thank you. Would you say this prayer with me? Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for giving us all of our emotions. Help us to understand them and use them wisely. Thank you for always being with us no matter how we feel. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. Well, good morning once again. My name is Mitchell. I'm the senior minister here at First United Methodist Church of Dallas. And if you are a guest worshiping with us for the first time or joining us online for the first time, welcome. We are delighted that you are here. We hope you come back and worship with us again in the future. Your presence matters. In fact, everyone who is here this morning or joining us online, we are grateful that you have taken time to participate in worship, and we want to know that you are here. So we're encouraging everyone to fill out a Connect card or check in on the Realm map so we can make sure that we're communicating all that's happening here at the church, and we are hearing from you, especially those things in your life that you need prayer for. We have a dedicated team of folks that uh, pray each and every day for the concerns that exist within our community 
and our broader world. So make sure that you let us know that you are here because we are really grateful that you are here. We have um, just really one announcement that I, uh, I wanted to draw to your attention, and that is uh, over the past several months, we have been working really hard to provide more and more opportunities for folks to engage with the church online. And so if you are traveling this summer, just know that our online campus essentially has a ton of different resources for you. You can keep up with worship, whether that's live or watch previous worship services. You can uh, pay attention to the sermon exclusively, or you can join our online community that, that takes place on Tuesday evenings called Studio 3A. There's also a podcast that Elizabeth and I host together Last week, we talked about communion, and this week, we're talking about baptism, and that podcast is called Howdy Theologian, so if you've not yet subscribed, please do so. You can find it wherever you listen to your podcast. We just want you to know that as summer is sort of underway, there are still opportunities for you to stay connected to us here at First Church, and we hope you'll take advantage of the plethora of things that are available to you online. With that, I'm gonna invite the ushers forward and invite you to pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we are grateful for yet again another opportunity to gather in this space we trust that your spirit is indeed moving amongst us, connecting us to one another and connecting us to the world. Help us to remain faithful. Help us to remain faithful to the call that you have on our life to follow Christ wherever he may be leading and help us to live generously so that we, know, we may know that our life is not solely about ourselves, but we exist for others. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.
You may be seated. And as we prepare to turn to God in prayer, I would like to invite you to especially be in prayer for the family of Jody Head, a longtime member of our church who passed away earlier this spring. Will you join me in an attitude of prayer? Gracious and loving God who created us and calls us good, we gather together today and we take a breath and we rest for just a moment in you. While it can seem like the demands of the world never cease, oh God, we remember that neither does your love and mercy for us. Your spirit goes before us and walks alongside us and it comes along behind us, surrounding us with grace, sometimes in ways we are not even aware of, inviting us, encouraging us, helping us to be more like you have called us and created us to be. Indeed, God, you made us all in your image and gave us the power of creativity. You set before us the path of grace and forgiveness, which we are to follow every day. You call us to lay down our lives out of love and compassion for one another. You nourish us with word and spirit, and you claim every single one of us as your child. And, oh God, we confess that we so often forget, we so often fall short, we let distractions and worry and self-preservation take precedence over everything else, and God, we confess that we fail so often to be the people that you have indeed created us to be. Lord, forgive us. Lord, forgive us. Help us to set aside all other considerations and allow your spirit to fill our hearts and our minds. Help us to hear your words and then to do them Help us to trust that whatever lies before us, you are with us and help us, oh God, to be faithful in all things. Lord, this morning for those in our church, maybe in the pews next to us, those who will travel near and far this season, who are traveling this season, for those who are celebrating new life, for those who have entered into the life to come, for those in our church who are struggling, who are in need, who are tired or overwhelmed or undone, Lord, bless them and help us all to surround one another with your love. O oh God, for our world, which groans still in the pain of war and strife, in which too many people are hungry for both physical and spiritual nourishment, where evil seems to have a chokehold, remind us that you have given us a spirit of courage and righteousness and help us to see this week the ways, big and small, that our faith calls us to act with purpose. Oh God, for this day, for this church, for this community, for all that we have, we give you thanks. And we pray this and always in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and with the fullness and confidence of your Holy Spirit with us, we say the prayer he taught us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Back 
Tara, Tim, James, thank you. Thank you. I know that James had been wanting to, to sing that song in, in sort of recognition of Reverend Joe Stoville, his father's 50 years of ordination. And so, Joe, we are grateful for your ministry and the ways in which you have cared so deeply for God's children. Congratulations on that milestone. It is incredible. I told Dana um, that I, I love having music before my sermon to help kind of set the stage or prepare ourselves spiritually, um, but, but sometimes I feel like I'm rather inadequate to follow what, uh, what just happens before me. So uh, thank you, Dana, grateful for you organizing such beautiful music on the church's behalf. Um, Keep it going. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Keep it going. Keep it going. Uh, also, I saw Inside Out 2 uh, this past week, and as Leah was uh, beautifully sort of walking our children through the different range of emotions that are presented in that film, uh, Anthony leaned over to us and said, it looks like our stoles sort of match our emotions. And so... Uh, <laughs> I am sadness. Uh, I'll let the other two speak for themselves. <laughs> it's good to be back with you all in the pulpit. Um, and I'm very grateful for the good work that Roy and Angela uh, provided and, and sort of the sermons that they delivered on, 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 on your behalf, on the church's behalf, on, on our clergy staff's behalf. It is a gift. It is a gift as a senior minister to know that when I am not in this pulpit, there is a whole host of clergy that are called to preach and preach well. And so I am very grateful that we have a clergy staff that take the role of preaching seriously. Um, and as a reminder, we are in a series called Sacred Glow. I'm very excited about the next few weeks. Uh, so we'll kind of finish June in this worship series, Sacred Glow. In July, we're bringing back the band series. If you remember last year, we we talked about band and the book of James. This July, we're going to be talking about the book of Job. And so, yes, we'll have some uh, screens back up in the sanctuary, be more of a casual vibe for the month of July. It's a teaching series, and we are really going to get into the book of Job. And Reverend Elizabeth Mosley and I will be sort of co-teaching this series together. I'm very excited about it. Uh, but here we are for the next two weeks in this series called Sacred Glow. Next week, Reverend Anna Hagler will be preaching about God's hospitality and what that means for us. But I want to just remind us that the whole, I guess, notion of this series is centered on this idea that we are, yes, we are imperfect vessels, these jars of clay, that through our perceived fragility, we can actually reflect God's goodness to the world. That each and every one of us has this ability to reflect the divine nature to all of creation. And while that reflection is not a perfect picture of who God is, and sometimes depends on the angle in which we're standing, we do have the capacity to reveal God's goodness to the world especially when we consider how we live out our life. The first week, we talked about the creative nature of God, and I very much enjoyed hearing about how many of you left this space several weeks ago after that sermon and went um, and lived creatively over the next week. I am very grateful that one, you listened, and two, that you actually tried to engage the world creatively. And it's because in the beginning, the very first things we learn about God is that God is creative, bringing order to chaos, bringing beauty out of nothingness, fashioning us out of dirt and clay 
And then God actually takes on human form in the incarnation. Christ is born into a very specific time and location as a carpenter, a craftsman. And in return, then, we are called to be creative. And as we create, as we make beautiful things, solve difficult problems, find possibility in a sea of absolutes, we reflect, then, the goodness of God. Two weeks ago, Roy talked about forgiveness and the challenge of a singular story becoming our narrative, and we forgive then because God forgives, and as we practice forgiveness, we show others God's goodness. Last week, Reverend Angela Williams preached her last sermon here at First Church. It was a fitting way for her to transition from this ministry to the ministry at Life Center UMC in DeSoto. And she offered us an understanding of Christ's compassion, right? That Christ as the one who offers compassion to the world through this scene of hungry and a weary crowd invites his disciples then to join in this holy time of caring. And through this example, this divine attribute of compassion is then breaking into the world. It is not only Christ's compassion, but then the disciples offer it, are invited to participate in and with Christ. And this compassionate God is made manifest to those who are hungry. Frankly, you have then a responsibility. You have a responsibility as Christ followers to live a life that reflects God's goodness to the world. And if we are made in the image of God in our lives, while imperfect our gifts, it is a reminder that our life is not for our own edification, but to reveal God's glory and God's grace and God's abundant love. So this morning we turn our attention then to God's purpose, one of The divine attributes we see in scripture is that God has a purpose and ponder what it means to participate in this purpose through the ongoing intentional faithfulness God demonstrates throughout scripture. And if God has a purpose and God is intentional, if God remains faithful, what does that then mean for us? How are we to respond to that? Our text this morning is found in the beautifully penned Gospel of John. We'll be reading, I know what it says in the bulletin, but we will be reading the first 15 verses of chapter 10. But just a little context. Today's text is a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples and others. And it involves a blind man. One chapter earlier, There is a blind man, and the question is, why is this man blind? Was it his parents' fault for their sin, or was it his own sin that caused this blindness? And Jesus says, nope. (laughs) It's neither one of those reasons. God doesn't punish us like that. In fact, God uses us as these imperfect vessels to bring about God's glory. And Jesus heals the man by making mud with his own spit. Think about the embodiment of that, the incarnational sort of reality of that. Jesus spits into the dirt, makes mud, puts that mud on this man's eyes. He washes then his eyes off at the pool of Siloam, and then he has sight. And the Pharisees get involved, questioning the man, uh, how did you become able to see? And the man's only response is, all I know is that I was blind and now I see. Confusion ensues. Jesus gets questioned and the Pharisees and disciples, they can't figure it out, which is typical in the Gospel of John. And then Jesus says this to those confused folks that are all around him. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. That's page 103 in your pew Bible in the New Testament. And I invite you to rise and body your spirit for the reading of the gospel. So 
So in response to this confusion, Jesus says, very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief or a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he was brought out all on his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but shockingly, they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves. The sheep runs away. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep, for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer and the one who wants us to flourish. Amen. So if you spend any time in the Gospels, you realize that Jesus has this sort of habit of following up confusion with a long explanation that is as clear as mud, in verse 6, Jesus says, uh, uses this metaphor, uh, but they have no idea what he is talking about. Kind of a Life of Brian moment for those who watch Monty Python. You know, wait, did he just talk about us being sheep? Did he just refer to himself as a shepherd? The connection is, in fact, rather odd given both the unattractive attributes of sheep and the social standing of shepherds but Jesus is really working hard to connect his ministry his actual purpose to the work of shepherds and for us to appreciate it we need just a little ancient sheep knowledge from the time period unlike Texas with barbed wire fences and barns and cattle guards, sheep were free to roam in the area in which Jesus grew up. And at night, when they were most vulnerable, they were placed in a sheepfold or pen that was constructed not out of wood, but out of stone. The walls would have actually been rather high to keep the most agile of predators out of the pen. And if the sheep were, in fact, pinned for the night, the shepherd was actually free to go get some good night's rest away from the flock. And someone would then sit at the gate. And Jesus is comparing his ministry to the ministry then of those who claim to have the best interest of people at heart, but look for the problems, the broken rules the wrong in the healing of others. And the metaphor or analogy churns as Jesus likens them to bandits and thieves who scale the walls of pens to seek power, wealth, and influence because sheep, in fact, have great value. They are just very, very vulnerable creatures. 
And it is the voice that the sheep know. It is the shepherd's voice that they respond to, which seems odd, but is in fact true. I say that because I've seen it. I don't know, though, any shepherds in real life. I have, I have no, does anyone know any shepherds? Yeah, I don't know any shepherds, but I witnessed this. I witnessed the power and authority and care of a shepherd once, one time. And it was in real life. I was traveling to Australia and New Zealand with my friend Gabby, and we were there to see my friend Peach. Peach lives in Wellington. Uh, his dad's from New Zealand, and his uncle had a house in Christchurch on the South Island uh, before the earthquake in 2011. And so we jumped down to the South Island uh, to drive around the countryside, which uh, is is not like the country in Texas. You know, when you say you're gonna go out to the country here in Texas, it's pretty flat and hot and there's a lot of bugs and stickers and you know, the, it's very different in New Zealand, the countryside. There are mountains that seem uh, to have gr to grow right out of the ocean. There are rock faced cliffs that abruptly end. And then immediately there are these lush green valleys thriving with all the rain and sun. There are snow cap capped peaks towering above you the whole time. It really is like, if you've never been to New Zealand, especially the South Island, it is really like you're in the movie Lord of the Rings, right? I guess that's why they shot it there. Uh, so we're driving around uh, on this windy switchback of a road uh, when Peach all of a sudden slams on the brakes and I look up, I was probably on my phone at the time, I look up and there's a huge flock of sheep, hundreds of sheep everywhere hanging off the mountainside, all weird and stuff, and all in the ditches next to the road, on the road, uh, relieving themselves. It was a huge mess. There's like hundreds and hundreds of sheep just right in front of us, and we cannot pass. And about 50 yards off in this sort of small, narrow pasture, there were these two old men, real-life shepherds, with tattered sweaters, white beards, wooden staffs, sort of looking like Leo Tolstoy out there. And Peach jumped out and walked over to them, and they were kind of staring at us like we were doing something wrong, which maybe we were, I don't, I don't know. And Peach spoke Kiwi to them and then jumped back in the car and said it'll be like two minutes. I was like, yeah, right. There's like hundreds of sheep right in front of us. And about 10 minutes later, these two old men wander over, Real life shepherds walk up to the road and they just start shouting loudly, saying something and all the sheep just sort of look at them, you know, sort of like they're doing their own thing and then they just go. <laughs> and then they just quickly move off the road. The sheep are actually listening to the instructions of the shepherd like there's some sort of dog. And so this idea that sheep actually know the shepherd's voice, this is actually true. And if this is true, then today's text invites us to see Christ as the one who calls us, beckons us to move to look up and notice and move towards God, towards the pastures and paths that are designed for us. We are to follow the voice of God, to get up and move. This idea of movement, of aligning ourselves with God and then actually physically moving towards God is a theme that we see in Scripture over and over and over again. The story of Abraham has it. The story of Exodus. The story of the promised land. The story of Jesus moving towards Jerusalem. And the disciples following Jesus are all examples of people in 
Scripture, listening to what God is saying and moving towards God. The story of the disciples in Acts, the very beginning of the church, is this faithful witness and involves movement. The life of Paul is constantly in motion, right? There is movement. There is a sense of divine purpose, and God remains faithful throughout it all. In an attempt, I think, for those God loves to learn and respond to God's voice. God keeps showing up so that we will attune our ears and hearts to what God has in store for us. To follow God's call to move. Faith is not static, it is dynamic, it is not stationary. It requires movement. The question we really should ask, though, is where are we going, right? Where are we going? What pastures is God calling us to? What is the point in all of this? What is God's purpose? John 10.10 10 tells us the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says, I have come so that they may have life and have it abundantly. This, my friends, is God's work in the world. God's beckoning, God's call on our life is so that we may have life and have it abundantly. The abundant life, that is what God wants for us. Think about that for just a moment. God wants you to have an abundant life. God wants you to flourish. God wants us to live a good, fulfilled life. God wants us to know the abundance of God's goodness. This is the point. This is the purpose. This is God's purpose. This is why the incarnation takes place. This is why Christ continues to reveal a new path for us. Too often, though, in Western Christianity, we believe God's real purpose is to judge and condemn and punish us. Too many pastors and churches are obsessed with sin because they are obsessed with an angry God. Which if you want an angry God, you can find that angry God in scripture, but it doesn't jive with Jesus, especially the Jesus we see in the Gospel of John. Remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. We all know that, especially thanks to the person who continues or people who continue to hold that up at every sporting event. Unfortunately, they do not put verse 17 on there as well, which says, indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God is, in fact, for us. God wants us to have an abundant life. God wants us to have a good life, a life that is not bound up in sin, destruction, and death. You know who obsesses about that, about death and decay and punishment? Jesus tells us it's the thief. It's the robber. That's what the text says. The counterfeit shepherd, the one who seeks power over mercy, who seeks money over justice, who seeks self-interest over God's desire. So that leaves us then with a choice. And as followers of Christ, the question before us is really a simple one. Whose voice are we listening to? Because we cannot reflect the goodness of God 
if we aren't listening to the call, the beckoning of the good shepherd. And the abundant life Christ so wishes for us is not found in the whispers or the calls of those cosplaying as shepherds. And if Christ's purpose is to invite others into the abundant life, our purpose must be the same. To reflect God to the world, we must have the abundant life of others squarely in front of us. This abundance, this life God wants for us, we must want it for others, not just for ourselves. And it all starts, I believe, it all starts by us learning to trust, by trusting that we know the good shepherd, that we trust God has the best intentions for us. And we learn to rejoice when people are healed. We learn to move off the road so others can continue their journey. And we are far away And when we are far away from the protection and comfort of the sheepfold, there is a real purpose to God's guidance into the pastures we are headed for. There is no doubt, friends, in this post-pandemic, post-disaffiliated United Methodist Church, we are heading out into the wilderness, far away from the places where we have found comfort and and security for decades. We are going to have to learn to trust the voice of the Good Shepherd, to trust that God's guidance is for a very real purpose and that we are faithfully listening and moving and learning this. Learning how to do this is a lifelong adventure. But the best news this morning is that there is real strength in numbers. Sheep can't defend themselves. They're awful at it. The only thing they have is a shepherd and a bunch of other sheep. There is real strength in numbers. And so as we move onward, as we move towards the voice of the good shepherd, we do so knowing that there is plenty of room for others to join us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. we close our service today, I invite you to take the red hymnal and turn to number 128. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. Let's rise and sing.
As you go out into the world, know that there are a lot of voices, a lot of noise, a lot of opportunities for us to follow a hundred different directions, but God remains faithful, and God is calling us towards the abundant life. May we have the courage to follow. Go in peace, friends. Amen.